Um, welcome to our expert panelists. We have uh, Dr. Paul Mason. Hi, Paul. Good evening. And uh, Nicole Moore, our dietitian. Hi, Nicole. Hello. Hi. Right. So we're going to jump straight in uh, today and uh, talk about calories because you know calories have probably been the the biggest buzzword in diet and food for the last fifty years. You know, everyone talks about calories and low cal and all this sort of stuff. So let's let's just go back to basics for a start. And uh, Paul, why don't you kick off and tell us what is a calorie? Well, I mean. If you go back to chemistry class, Peter, basically a calorie is the amount of energy required to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. It's purely a chemical measure. And we then transported this into the human body somehow. We thought, well, okay, well, this works with a Bunsen bur burner and a beaker. Maybe this also works with a human body. The problem is... Calories don't help us answer the question that needs to be answered. See, if we ask the question, do people who are gaining weight, are they consuming too many calories? Well, obviously the answer is yes. They're consuming more calories than they're burning. But the question we need to have answered and the one which calories as a, a unit of measurement do not help us answer at all is why. Why do people consume too many calories? Because if we can answer that question, then we can start fixing the problem. And unfortunately, when we just look at calories, which is basically a unit of energy, it doesn't help us answer that question at all. So this whole sort of calories in, calories out, you know, if you, if you expend more calories than you, than you eat, you lose weight and, and vice versa. Is that, does that have any logic to it or is that totally flawed? No, well, of course, it, it's common sense. You know, if you're, if you're getting bigger than, you know, you otherwise were, then more energy must be coming in. But the question is not. I mean, it's obvious to everybody. It's just like saying, you know, why is the room overcrowded? Well, because more people walked into the room than left the room. I mean, but that doesn't tell us exactly why. You know, maybe, as you said, because somebody dropped, a you know, a bucket of money in the middle of the floor and everybody's coming in to get the money. That tells you why the room is crowded. You know, if we want to understand why people overeat, why people consume more than they otherwise need to, then it's not just whether a calorie, you know, how many calories did you eat? The question is, where did those calories come from? And how is that impacting on the physiology of the body or the way the body works? All right. Well, Nicole, why don't you tell us where are the possibilities that these calories came from? I mean, where do calories come from? Well, I guess we've got, you know, three different macronutrients that people eat that have a calorie attachment, so to speak. Um, so I always talk to my clients about, you know, we get um, calories or fuel from um, carbohydrate, we get calories or fuel from, you know, protein, and we get calories and fuel from fat. So there, I guess, are three sort of main macronutrients where we get calories from. Um, and as, um, you know, Paul was mentioning, is that those calories impact our body in different ways. So, you know, we cannot... Um, assume that 100 calories of salmon is going to do the same thing in our body that 100 calories of, you know, Coke would. Um, so I guess that's where the main calories come from. And as we go through today, it's really about how those particular macronutrients um, impact our body. I mean, protein um, uh, has four calories per gram, as does carbohydrate. But, you know, we know particularly sugars and carbohydrates which break down into simple sugars in the blood will give us a far different response to our inflammatory hormones and to insulin um, than, um, you know, a protein will or even a fat. So we, we know where calories come from, but, you know, we have to stop counting the calories more so looking at how those different macronutrients impact um, our bodies and our, our, our metabolism. So, um, but yeah, in, in a nutshell, the, there's three main nutrients where we're going to get fuel from. All right, and let, let's just follow up on what you made of uh, of the uh, the salmon, the hundred calories or the calories from the salmon and the calories from the Coca Cola. Um, 
So Nicole, tell tell us what what what's the difference? You know, how does uh, you know how do the calories from something like salmon um, affect our body compared to the uh, the calories from um, a, a sugar such as uh, as Coca Cola? Well, I guess um, if you look at your Coca Cola, um, what we've got is a lot of you know added sugar. It's just a bucket of sugar. Um, and there's sucrose in there. And, you know, sucrose is um, made up of, um, you know, uh, glucose um, and fructose. Um, so those sugars, um, you know, impact our bodies um, very differently to what we're going to find with the macronutrients of salmon. And so, um, and I'm sure Paul will be able to, you know, expand on this um, biochemical pathway very well. Um, from a simplicity point of view, you've got, um, you know, glucose um, that's going to impact our blood glucose directly. And with huge amounts of glucose going in our blood, we're going to impact our sugars that sort of, I guess, down the line impacts the insulin in our body. And we know when we've got prediabetes or chronic disease, um, we've got, you know, chronically elevated insulin that creates a lot of problems, inflammation, um, the sugar we know attacks and glycate cells and cholesterols and just causes, you know, poor health. Um, so there's the glucose part and then there's, you know, the fructose um, part as well. And, you know, fructose is even, I guess, more damaging. It sort of bypasses um, the blood sugar impact, but it has a huge impact on your liver. Um, and you get um, fat being produced from the sugar and we get fatty liver and that fatty liver creates worse insulin resistance and then the insulin resistance is creating the inflammation um, and then we're getting um, you know problems again with putting on weight because we know insulin is a fairly lipogenical fat storage hormone and then we put weight around the belly and that creates worse blood sugars and insulin so you've kind of got this vicious cycle you know when you look at you know oily fish or fatty salmon, the main macronutrients in that are going to be, you know, fat and protein, um, you know, and protein is a satiating nutrient. It doesn't give us as elevated insulin um, as does the, um, the, the, the sugar. Um, so we're going to feel fuller for longer. We don't get these big insulin spikes as much. Um, and we know that, as I mentioned, that protein is a far more satiating nutrient. We feel fuller. We we know that we can drink gallons of Coke or eat, you know, buckets of ice cream, but, you know, once you've had a certain slab of salmon, you kind of get full and you're done. So, you know, protein is very satiating. You're not going to get these um, as big insulin spikes and, and as big glucose spikes. And you've got fat in there as well. Um, and fats, you know, don't spike insulin. They won't give you elevated glucose. And again, they're very filling. So, you, you know, in your body, you don't get this wave of inflammation because the macronutrients there are fats and they're protein and they're slowly digested um, versus the Coke with the, um, you know, the sucrose, which is breaking down to fructose and glucose. So I guess that's how I explain it to a lot of my clients that come in. So even if we had the same amount of calories of salmon and Coke, they are having a far different impact on our metabolic pathways and, and our health. Yeah, I think that was a really good uh, good way of explaining it because it's a, it's a it's a tricky concept to, to get across. But uh, Paul, how how do you sort of explain that to your uh, to your patients uh, the, the calories and, and different uh, forms of mac macronutrients? Well, I guess I, I don't want to get bogged down into the weeds here, but if we have a look at it, um, the reason we've demonised fat is simply because fat has more energy density, more caloric density than carbohydrates and protein. So we've basically sacrificed fat at the altar of the calorie uh, we're, because we're assuming that calories are everything that matters. It's the only thing that matters. Mm. But when we actually have a look at food, foods are things that we need, they nourish us. They provide us with the building blocks for our you know, developing bodies, our brains. They help us not just survive but to thrive. So if you were to feed a child just pure carbohydrates, because effectively carbohydrates are a whole lot of nothing. So what do I mean by that? So when I look at food, I want to see the building blocks that will help build a developing skeleton, will build the organs, will, will provide the building blocks for a brain. And carbohydrates don't do that. They're basically energy. So carbohydrates are just molecules of sugar all holding hands, all joined together, glucose, 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 which is a molecule of sugar. So, and any source of carbohydrate is basically 
nutrient deficient. They don't provide what our body needs to sustain us. They don't provide us with a, what it needs to be in good, robust health. Whereas something like fat, which we've sort of fear-mongered because of the nutrient density, the caloric density, well, that comes with a heck of a lot of nutrients. You would have heard of fat-soluble nutrients, vitamin A, vitamin D, E, K. These are absolutely essential for health. You you know, you don't get them with carbohydrate-based foods in sufficient quantities, if at all. Mm. So, you know, the simple fact is that by focusing on the calorie, we end up saying, oh, well, carbohydrates must be better because they're less calorically dense than fat. Um, and we end up missing out on these nutrient-dense foods because understand that when you're having a natural food, the nutrient density always follows protein and fat. It doesn't follow the carbohydrate. So if you're having a source of carbohydrates that's uh, got a lot of nutrient density to it, almost certainly that's because it's going to have been fortified. Why do we fortify cereals with vitamin D and then we proudly proclaim it on the label? It's because without fortification, that food is nutrient deficient. But natural foods, as they occur naturally, with good amounts of protein and fat, they are nutrient dense. So we need to focus on the things that matter with food. So first of all, as Nicole very elegantly just described, if you're eating carbohydrates, the hormonal milieu that that will lead to in the body will make you sick. That will make you metabolically unwell. That will contribute to high blood pressure. That will contribute to, you know, what we call metabolic syndrome, central adiposity, so on and so forth, may even have impacts on inflammation in the immune system. Whereas if you're having natural healthy foods, they don't have that any of those kind of effects at all. They don't lead to overeating, more importantly. So the simple difference, coming back, circling right back at the start, I said the question shouldn't be how much calories do people overeat. Yes, they do overeat. The question should be why. When you put the wrong foods into the body, you drive hunger. When you're not providing satiety that you get with protein and fat, you will overeat. If you're consuming carbohydrates, you're very, very much more likely to overeat. Okay, well, let's talk about um, low calorie diets. And uh, Nicole, I mean, I'm sure you have plenty of uh, people who come to see you who've tried a low calorie diet and uh, and failed. So, what? How do you explain to them what uh, what effect a low calorie diet has had on them, and why maybe it hasn't succeeded, and, and some other to some of diet might uh, might be better. Yeah, and I guess this is where partly I draw from, um, you know, so many people have come in and they have done all these low calorie diets and they just don't shift weight. And we know when we eat a low calorie diet, the, the thing we tend to strive for is to eat, you know, fat free products and, and um, you know, we, we avoid proteins and fats as much because they, you know, more calorie dense, you know, you can have a um, you know, nuts and, and, and meat and chicken and full fat dairy. So you see people on these low calorie diets and they're, you know, not eating as much um, uh, and it's driving their insulin because they're eating that Weight Watcher biscuit that's got only two points in it, but it's, you know, all carbohydrates with some sugars in there still, but it's a small cookie. So it's low calorie so we can eat it and, and people are eating, you know, if you go for a certain frozen, you know, weight loss meals that has, you know, come out to you. Um, they're all rice driven and they're pasta driven. And I guess how I explain it um, in one respect, when we look at insulin being still technically a lipogenic um, hormone that in excess, um, if it's chronically elevated, can still contribute to people storing that fat and not being able to access it. So um, this is something, um, you know, in one of your talks, Paul, a long time ago where, you know, we think about this fat cell and if we're eating a lot of carbohydrate and we're chronically elevating our insulin because we're metabolically unwell and we're carrying fat around the belly, um, you know, there's this overstimulation of fat storage and the body struggles to also access that fat. So I sort of say, you know, if you think of a balloon, it's storing all the fat and the sugar, but it's not letting it out. And if you're eating not many calories, um, and your body's struggling to get the fat out, it's more in fat storage mode with insulin because you're not eating much, but it's carb driven. You've had a Weight Watchers bar and then you've had a small crusket, you know, which is high in carbohydrate with, you know, some fat free, you know, 
long time ago, there used to be 99% fat-free cheese. I think that was called plastic, but, you know, and they used to put that on their crusca and then they were eating, you know, um, you know, little fruit salads and fat-free yogurts. And so they were driving constantly in small doses all day, still carbohydrates and sugar. And so their body was able to access the fat freezer as effectively and therefore their bodies just try to match the reduced intake by slowing down as well. Um, so they're on this treadmill of trying to eat less, but they're not really moving much of the weight, partly because of that insulin kind of cycle. Um, you know, so I, I take them away and I say, let's move away from counting calories. You need to eat, as Paul has mentioned, your proteins and your fats. And, you know, you know, if you eat more of those things, you also end up speeding up your metabolic rate. We've seen studies where eating protein increases metabolic rate. We know low carb diets can increase the amount of calories you burn every day. So feed your body with the right foods that don't create those insulin spikes. And, and, you know, so, so many people go, oh my God, I'm eating more food, but because they're not eating the carbohydrate calorie, which drives hunger, which drives fat storage, they end up feeling naturally more satiated anyway. And they find they eat less frequently, which we know if you don't snack as much as well, you don't spike insulin. And so they naturally feel fuller, um, but they're feeding their body the right nutrients and they're not putting their body in this fat storage, low calorie, low fat mode. Um, and I guess that's how I explain why they've struggled. And if they just start feeding their bodies the right macronutrients that don't spike hunger and that don't spike insulin, um, that they just will lose weight because the body can now get to that fat freezer and they don't need to snack as much and they don't feel driven to eat, you know, a, you know, a packet of chips and then snack on some pretzels. They just feel full. They look at their watch and they go, whoa, I haven't eaten for four hours. And that also drives, you know, um, reduced insulin spikes as well. And they're not snacking as much, which helps with weight loss. So, again, I explain it from a hormonal perspective that the calorie, low calorie diet hasn't worked for those reasons. And that if they just feed their bodies the right fuel and don't worry about calories, just focus on getting their processed carbohydrates down and get sugar out, that they will just lose weight. And what happens every two weeks, they come in, they say, I'm feeling guilty. And I say, why? They go, I'm losing weight. I'm actually enjoying what I'm eating and I'm not hungry for the first time ever. And I say, well, isn't that a great, you know, isn't that a great program to be following? And, you know, they'll, they'll go, I was at the restaurant the other night eating my big steak with my creamy sauce. And someone said, wow, you look amazing. You've lost weight. You know, what diet are you on? And they point to their plate and go, well, this is the diet. And the people are going, that can't be right. You should be eating a tuna salad instead surely to be losing weight so it isn't you know it is about the nutrients you put in your body um, and not about counting and restricting and starving your body of nutrients yeah paul tell us a little bit about uh hunger and, and so on because one, one of the things about you know when people go onto a low calorie diet i mean they get hangry you know <laughs> hungry and angry and uh explain to us why that happens well basically uh, hunger Two behaviours uh, uh, predicate the survival of the human species, and one of those is eating. I mean, this is a we're hardwired to want to eat. So, in terms of hangry, there, there's two types of drives to it. So, one of them is an emotional urge, and what this relates to, this relates to the neuro transmitters, the chemicals within our brain, the rewarding chemicals. Mm -hmm. So if you're often feeling flat and people describe themselves as being a stress eater, as I'm sure Nicole, many of your clients would, I know many of my patients do, uh, then the reason for stress eating is that when you consume something that's, uh, you know, that's manufactured by the food industry to um, tickle what we call the bliss point, you know, they very uh, precisely craft the ratios of sugar and uh, salt and fat to make it as palatable, some would say, as addictive as possible. That releases a bomb of neurotransmitter chemicals in your brain and just very transiently makes you feel really, really good. So that explains the urge for stress eating because when you're stressed, these levels of dopamine and serotonin and the mesolimbic pathway of the brain, that's low. You're deficient. So basically stress eating is self-medicating to restore neurotransmitter levels back up to a level where you feel a little bit more normal. But there's also another element of the brain, and that's an energy supply. 
So we may not realise it, but the brain, while it only represents 2% of the body's weight, it actually uses 20% of the body's energy. It is incredibly metabolically active. So on average, 10 times more active than the rest of the body. So what can actually happen is we've talked about how insulin resistance as a precursor condition to diabetes, so on and so forth, that can actually lead to defects in the body's ability to use energy appropriately. Well, that can also affect the brain. Certain parts of the brain are much more at risk of this than others. So if you're insulin resistant in the rest of your body, that's also going to be affecting the energy supply to your brain. And basically, if, you're, if you don't have enough energy getting into your brain, your body will say, hey, you need to get it. So obviously, you won't be feeling very well. You won't be feeling very sharp. That's this cognitive disturbance side of it. But this insatiable desire, this insatiable urge to feed yourself, you know, a, a Snickers bar or something like that, the, the thing that we associate with hangry, well, that's <laughs> physiologically explained by the state of insulin resistance in the brain. And in fact, it's no coincidence now that we're starting to term dementia type 3 diabetes. We're starting to understand that in many ways, dementia is a metabolic disease of the brain underpinned by insulin resistance. So, and I think you well understand this, Peter. I, I heard you many years ago talking about your, uh, your own low carb journey and how you'd get to 10.30 in the morning and you'd be wanting to hunt down a small child because <laughs> you'd be ravenously hungry. And now that when you address the root cause of the, the underlying problem, which is insulin resistance, that that just goes away. I thought you were going to talk about my dementia, actually. But anyway, um, <laughs> so, Paul, just one other thing that Nicole alluded to the fact of... Uh, of, of, you know, when you you know go into a low calorie uh, diet, I mean, you basically your body goes into starvation mode and and goes into protective mode, and it's and it's what we call this basal metabolic rate slows down. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sorry, was that for Nicole or myself? No, no, it's for you. Yeah, it's for you. Okay, well, well, basically, um, we often we like to project onto people and blame people for having trouble losing weight. Even when the, all the science says it's not, there's other underlying factors. And one of the factors that we used to blame people for was that they just weren't active enough. And then we came up with this, uh, this terminology of uh, unconscious behaviour or fidgeting behaviour, so on and so forth. And we found that people who were naturally slim and of healthy weight, they tend to express these uh, unconscious behaviours where they'll just burn more energy, what we call fidgeting behaviours. So for a period of time, we used to tell people, well, you just have to do engage in more unconscious activity. Now, just think about that for a moment, how completely illogical that is. And, yes, I have heard doctors tell that to their patient. You just need to engage in more unconscious activity. The research shows that if you do that, you'll, uh, you'll lose weight. Well, the question is, it's unconscious. You, you're not in control of it. So what is in control of it? And it's your hormones. So if you are having an excessive amount of insulin in your body, then that's telling your body that you need to be in energy storage mode. So in effect, if you think of your your energy in two partitions. You've got what you want to be storing and what you want to be using. And high levels of insulin will actually shift that balance. So you put more in storage and you have less available for use. In that situation, your unconscious energy expenditure will naturally go down. What we call your resting metabolic rate will naturally go down. And this is why when we do the best quality study on measuring people's energy expenditure at rest, not doing anything, just sitting there seeing how much energy you burn, we find that when we put people on low-carbohydrate diets, the kind that will actually lower the insulin levels, 
uh, there was one study that found that their daily energy expenditure would increase by something like 300 kilocalories a day. And that's equivalent to what you'll burn riding an exercise bike for an hour. So think about that. These You don't get told to do anything differently. You just change your diet and all of a sudden you're burning energy as though you're riding a bike for an extra hour a day. That's what insulin and low carbohydrate diets can do to your resting metabolism, your resting energy expenditure. And on the other hand, if you know if you're reducing your calories, your body goes into starvation mode because uh, it, it needs to protect itself, doesn't it? And it slows your metabolic rate, and uh, therefore, when you go back onto a normal amount of calories, you've got this slower metabolic rate, and you tend to put on more weight than when you before you started your uh, your diet. So uh, that's why you get these crazy sort of yo-yo dieting of uh, people uh, losing weight and then uh, then putting on even more weight than they. Uh, they lost in the, in the first place. So well, it's even worse than that, Peter, because when you go on a caloric restricted diet, you have to understand you're doing it with the mental model that you're afraid of fat. Because remember, fat has got more caloric density. And if we're only focusing on calories, then we only care about fat. But the problem is once you take fat out of the diet, you have to replace it with something else, with one of the other macronutrients. And invariably, we re replace it with carbohydrates. So then you go on a calorically deficient diet that proportionally, maybe not in absolute terms, but in proportional terms, it's got more carbohydrate content, which leads to a disproportionate insulin response. Mm -hmm. So you're putting yourself into a starvation state and then you're changing your hormonal milieu within your body. You're basically upping your insulin levels to also put yourself into a starvation state. So you're trying to restrict the calories coming in while making your body being in an energy storing mode and you've only got this amount of energy that you can actually burn. No wonder you're going to feel lousy. <laughs> good, uh, good explanation. So, Nicole, I mean, we, we sort of uh, abandoned counting calories or we were suggesting that people don't count calories. What about counting carbohydrates? Uh, what's your sort of thoughts on uh, on whether we should be counting or how sort of strictly or enthusiastically we should be uh, counting carbohydrates or should we not bother? Yeah, look, I, uh, I guess there's a few answers to this and it, it really comes down to the individual. So um, I guess the best way is to be able to understand, you know, what carbohydrates are um, and then, you know, in a sim simple way is to go, look, these are your proteins, your meat, your chicken, your fish, your eggs, um, you know, your full fat dairy, um, you, you know, nuts and eat plenty of them to satiety. I go, you know, add a bit of fat. Um, so, you know, let's look at our fat list, whether it's avocado, whether it's butter, whether it's cream, whether it's olive oil. Um, and let's add some low carb above ground vegetables. And there are a few exceptions to those rules, but generally if it grows above the ground, we're good, slap it in a salad, steam it, put it with some protein to satiety, don't worry about portions, eat to feel full and add some healthy fat so that we've got a, a balance of real food. Um, and I try to help them sort of navigate what that might look like sort of for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, so that's really the best way because if we don't have to track and count and we just know what a fat is, what a protein is um, and, you know, what carbs to avoid, you know, let's not have sugar, um, you know, added sugars, sweet foods, let's watch, um, you know, those simple carbohydrates. Let's, um, you know, eliminate or avoid for a while your bread, your pasta, your rice. Um, I still limit fruit um, in, in, in a certain amount. Um, you know, let's take away those grains for a while and, and teach them what those carbs are and just don't have those and eat the other stuff. Um, and generally that's enough. You know, people can, you know, understand the basics of it, know what their plate should look like, know what foods they should be putting on their plate and know what they should be avoiding, those sugars and, and those complex carbohydrates um, and eat, you know, plenty of, you know, above ground green leafy veggies. Now, for some people that's perfect and then for other people they might not be progressing as much and so that's where I might decide to teach people how to count carbs and that's where I start you know teaching people what a ketogenic diet might look like with 20 grams or what a low carb diet might look like at 50 and where is your diet at you know when you started this and we just want to lower those carbohydrates so carb counting can be useful if people are maybe not understanding where their carbs are coming from, or, you know, I will say to people that, you know, 
don't eat carbohydrate, but they come back and they've gone, yeah, I haven't eaten any carbohydrate, but I have my porridge with natural honey and a banana for breakfast. And I go, well, you're still giving yourself a huge amount of carbohydrate and you're very insulin resistant and your blood sugars are still high. So let's swap it over to the formula. Let's do some eggs, which is our protein, some avocado, which is our fat, some above ground green stuff, which is our spinach. Um, so carb counting sometimes is necessary if people aren't understanding it or they're carb creeping and they're not progressing from a, you know, and they're still hungry, you know, they're craving them, you know, maybe they're just having too much carbohydrate for their body. Their sugars aren't coming down. So sometimes carb counting is um, necessary. It just comes down to progress. And some people do amazing and they're progressing. Other people come back and they're not understanding it. So if I can teach them, you know, well, look, low carb means 50. Let's see where you're sitting at. And they realize, oh, I ate three bananas and I did actually have that muesli bar, but it said high protein. And, you know, I didn't realize when I looked closer, you know, there was added sugar and there was lots of oats and heaps of dried fruit. So it has a place. Um, and I think we either... Um, carb count if necessary and people aren't progressing and that's where we look at the 50 grams of carbohydrate as low carb but always remember people are having up to 300 grams of carbohydrate I mean if you start your day with the healthy you know processed porridge quick cook oats and you you put some you know dried fruit and tin fruit and then you put you know honey on it you still you could be sitting at 100 grams of carbohydrate and we know that four grams of carbohydrate is technically a teaspoon of sugar that's going to impact your glucose and your insulin so, you know, that's not a great start. And, um, you know, so, you know, it just comes down to the individual, which is what we should be doing, individualising our diets um, from a low-carb perspective for everyone differently. So that's how I approach it in practice. Um, Paul, I'm not sure how you would approach that with carb counting or whether you're more general with your education with your patients. You're on mute, Paul. You're on mute. Okay. Oh, so, some would say uh, that's an improvement, but uh, anyway. <laughs> that's all right. We, we may have a, uh, a little bit of uh, child play in the background. Oh. Now, <laughs> I'm not a dietitian like you, uh, so I don't get into the nitty-gritty, um, mm. but I do have just a couple of overwhelming or overarching principles. And at the end of the day, it's very difficult to predict exactly how many carbohydrates any one individual may consume before they start having reactions. So, for instance, my, uh, my carbohydrate intake is likely to be, you know, while it's very low, my capacity to consume carbohydrates before it starts to affect my blood sugars is going to be quite different to um, the level that many of my patients could consume without affecting their blood sugar levels. So I always like to do a bit of a test. And, you know, if I throw back, you know, we're on the Defeat Diabetes um, podcast here. So many of our members actually have diabetes and they'll be insulin-dependent diabetics. In this situation, you can actually uh, get what we call a continuous glucose monitor, which is a, a 20 cent piece size device that will just stick to the back of your arm and that will provide continuous monitoring in real time on your blood sugar levels over a two-week period. So if you're not an insulin-dependent diabetic and you say you're a non-insulin-dependent diabetic, all you need is a letter from your doctor and you'll be able to order one online. It's called the uh, Freestyle Libra. Um, you do need to do it under medical supervision, so we'll make that very clear. But once you get a continuous glucose monitor, you can then track your exact blood sugar response to absolutely everything you eat. And not the, just the type of food, but also the quantity. So for people who are having what Nicole referred to earlier as carb creep, you're just getting a little bit of hidden carbohydrate coming in and that's causing a bit of a problem. If you're not exactly sure where it's coming from, a continuous glucose monitor is a beautiful way so that you can work out exactly what threshold of carbohydrate intake, both in terms of amount and type, actually works for your personal metabolism. So, Paul and, and Nicole, I want to ask you both this question. I mean, um, is there ever a, a, a time or, or, a, or a, a period where a low calorie, like an 800 calorie a day diet might be helpful. And Michael Mosley talks about his uh, 800 calorie a day sort of short term uh, weight loss. And we, we actually even have a, a rapid weight loss program on our Defeat Diabetes uh, 
app. So is there a, a role for sometimes, you know, people that want to really get stuck into, uh, you know, rapid weight loss and, and kickstart their, their program uh, to have a, a period of, uh, say, four to six weeks where they, they go low calorie as well as low carb and then gradually sort of ease back into uh, into sort of more normal calories. So do, do you ever um, suggest that to your patients, Paul? Look, I don't exclude it. Uh, the simple fact is there's lots of different types of diets that work for lots of different people, and we have to understand we exist in the real world. And now if I give you a very strict ketogenic style diet, that will turn some people into a social prior. They won't feel that they can go out and have their morning cup of coffee or their, you know, with their mother's club group or, you know, they might not be able to go and have a drink with the boys or do what they normally do. So we have to understand that people don't exist in a box. People live in the wider world and they live in a social context. So something like an 800 calorie restricted diet might mean that, yes, it's not a low carb meal particularly, but you go out and maybe that low carb meal there is with your friend group, your circle of friends. And then you come back and, you know, what you do on your own, you're very happy to be fasting for the rest of that 24-hour period. At the end of the day, there's more than one way to, uh, to get to the desired destination. Now, sometimes it might be slower, it might be quicker. My preferred preference would be um, to allow people to eat healthily and to eat adequate amounts. And I don't like people going hungry. But if you want to eat slightly different foods for whatever reasons that fit within somebody's particular lifestyle then i'll absolutely think you know it's better to don't let perfect be the enemy of good and that's something which i see in a lot of patients now what do i mean by that what what does you know perfect being the enemy of good mean it means that sometimes when we set the bar too high when we strive to do too much it's just so un attainable that people don't even bother trying so i think uh, you know in this field we have to be very careful about making sure that what we're asking people to do is realistic and if that's going to be an 800 calorie michael mosley style mixed diet where you get to have a bit of these uh these treats so be it you whatever it takes nicole what about you if patients come to you and say yeah look i, I want to go low carb but i really want to lose weight quickly mm. Um, look, I think in the beginning, which is kind of how we did it with Defeat Diabetes, is starting people, you know, um, I often start people low carb um, and make sure they're understanding that. And what's really interesting is people often come back. And in the beginning, um, even though I'm not a huge fan of, you know, snacking regularly because, you know, it still gives us um, spikes in glucose and insulin, um, I say, you know, look, feed as much as you need on your proteins and your fats and your above ground greens. Now, what happens, as we know, with having more protein and, you know, not having the sugars, we just get fuller quicker. So most people without me telling them come back and they might be doing, um, you know, they might be skipping a bit of breakfast. Um, and so they're actually naturally doing sort of a rapid weight loss program on some days where they went, oh, I got up and I was busy and I wasn't really hungry. So I just kind of had my black coffee and I ate at, you know, 12 o'clock. And, you know, is that a problem? And I say, well, no, you know, as long as you're doing it naturally and you're, you know, um, feeding on the right foods, then it will definitely kickstart. So I think most people tend to go into some form of um, lower calorie eating without actually trying because they're just not hungry. Um, and so then I think that there's room if people feel comfortable with it. That's just how I work in my clinic. Um, you know, some people just love breakfast, love lunch, love dinner. Um, I think with the rapid weight loss program, we've allowed some days of sort of slight restriction and then days where they feed up. So it's not this consistent every single day, a restricted calorie intake. Um, so I think it's, a, it, and like Paul said, everyone's individual. You've really got to look at that individual and see where they're sitting at. Um, but I just find people naturally do it. They just don't feel hungry. And, you know, they'll look at their watch and five, six hours has gone by. So often people naturally um, will do a, a lower calorie a diet um, or eating day without trying. Um, so they're doing rapid weight loss without really trying. And then other days they're hungry. And I think we know that our bodies sometimes need more and sometimes need less. And if we feed when we're hungry and don't feed when we're not on a low carb program, it becomes very natural to incorporate that. So um, that's kind of how I find it works in, in my practice. Um, 
And, um, you know, if you still want to go out for that coffee, we know, you know, fat doesn't really spike glucose and insulin. So, you know, I say have a bit of cream in your coffee if you want. Um, and, you know, that keeps them full. So we've got to look at the individual. Um, I think there's benefits in fasting. If people are comfortable, we know it helps improve insulin sensitivity and that's going to help reduce inflammation and help us access our fat freezer, make us feel less hungry. Um, you know, it's just about not having it as a, you know, making sure that you're comfortable with it. So, you know, that's how I approach it. But as I said, I think there's room for it. And I think that people do naturally do it. But if you start people on a, you know, low carbohydrate program, and then you go, oh, let's do some rapid weight loss straight away. I think most people find that, you know, that can be overwhelming. So it's sort of get low carb and then introduce your kickstart if you feel you can. Um, and we have to, as practitioners, just read that individual and see where they're at and what their natural hunger is. Um, and if you don't fight it, you know, you do fine. Low carb, you just don't feel as hungry anyway. Great. Okay, look, we've got a ton of questions, so uh, and not a lot of time. So let's uh, let's whip through a few of uh, these, some really good questions. Um, one from Andrea. If you reduce your carbs long enough to improve your insulin resistance, does it follow you might be able to increase your carb capacity? Nicole, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think Paul probably eloquently answered that before, is that um, it's all about how much carbohydrate your body tolerates. And I think if you've reversed and put your disease in remission and you've lost weight or your waist hips dropped and your bloods are all good, then it's just a matter of monitoring if we're talking about from a diabetes perspective or a pre-diabetes perspective, you know, monitoring your blood glucose. And seeing, you know, where you can sit comfortably, where you're still maintaining the good weight that you've lost or you're still maintaining, um, you know, the good blood glucose control. And part of this process is, you know, we're hoping that we're improving insulin sensitivity over time um, because we're not hammering it with loads of carbohydrate and sugars all the time. So, you know, I do find some of my clients, um, once we've sort of put their diabetes into remission, um, they're quite um, comfortably able to tolerate a little bit of extra carbohydrate every day and they can bring back a bit more fruit or they can, you know, have, you know, um, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, some rice in the evening. And as long as their sugars are staying good, um, then we're okay with that. So I really have to look at everyone individually. Um, some people really um, long term find that they don't tolerate it very well and that they might be able to do a you know, some carb cycling on a weekend, but they need to do an 80-20 rule, whereas other people are, you know, they seem to have, you know, really improved their insulin and they're coping with a, a bit more carbohydrate. So it really comes down to, you know, the health benefits you've received and if they stay there. And you just have to monitor. I think the CGM, if you can do it, is great um, because you do see if you're suddenly, you, you your blood glucose was sitting at, you know, 5.2s all the time and then, you're eating a bit more fruit every day and you've started eating, you know, um, regular bread every day and suddenly you see your average blood sugar sitting at 5.8, then that's, a, to me, a red flag that maybe you're over-carbing yourself and you just got to kind of play with it until you get to the right level. So that's, I guess, you know, for everyone that comes in, that's how we try to work it, um, particularly if a lot of my clients haven't been able to access a CGM, they're checking their sugars manually. Um, we still work with that same concept of checking blood glucose over over time and and just keeping an eye on it. So that's yeah, that's what works for what I find works in my practice. Okay, a few more questions. If you reduce your um, sorry, no, do some patients have more trouble with weight loss if they consume fully caffeinated coffee? What's your thoughts on coffee, uh, Paul? Uh, short answer: Yes, undoubtedly yes. Um, so. We're not going to dig into the weeds too much because this goes into a whole lot of other pathways for inflammatory health and autoimmune health, and we're talking primarily about metabolic health today. Um, but undoubtedly, some people do not react positively to coffee. Um, often the need to consume coffee uh, basically reflects the fact that somebody may be chronically sleep-deprived to begin with. I'm sure, you know, you've all had patients who say, oh, I can drink coffee, it doesn't affect me, I still drop right off to sleep. Well, if you're that person, you are chronically sleep deprived. So uh, because there is a, uh, if you're drinking caffeinated coffee and it's not keeping you awake, um, you already have a problem. And we know that chronic sleep deprivation affects hormones called leptin and ghrelin and basically also contributes to insulin resistance. So you end up with a triple whammy, a triple hormonal whammy that leads you to gaining weight. 
So uh, sure. also uh, decaf coffee is not caffeine free. Mm -hmm. It is reduced caffeine, but it can still have a not insignificant amount of caffeine in it. The half-life of caffeine is approximately six hours. So if you're going to bed at 10 p.m. at night, and you have a coffee at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, exactly one half of that coffee, that caffeine in that coffee, will still be active when you're trying to go to sleep. So coffee certainly has a lot of problems, as well as triggering inflammation in susceptible individuals. So uh, make sure that if you're reliant on coffee that you've got appropriate sleep hygiene, that you are sleeping enough, um, you may not be. And if you think it's not affecting you sleeping, then you almost certainly are sleep deprived. Okay. Um, Nicole, Lorraine asked, uh, what do you eat if you have problems digesting fats and some of the low carb vegetables, which are high in FODMAPs? Hmm. So I guess part of that question is, you know, if I've got clients that are, do have FODMAP issues um, and they're struggling with, you know, the extra cauliflower, um, you know, um, in their diet, um, it's, I guess, from a vegetable perspective, it's literally just, you know, trying to go for those lower carb, um, lower carb, sorry, low carb on the brain, lower FODMAP vegetables. Um, so, you know, you can still have plenty of, you know, green leafy stuff that's low in carb that is low in FODMAP, you know, zucchini. So we can have our zucchini noodles still or steamed zucchini, baby spinach, tomatoes, cucumbers. So I don't think we're limited even if you can't digest um, some of those vegetables, um, you know, cauliflower, you know, so some people on low carb, you know, are eating lots of cauliflower rice and baked cauliflower and cauliflower soup and, and they start to get gut problems. So it's just a matter of switching over to the lower carb vegetables um, and you're not going to, you know, get nutrient deficient by just sticking to those lower carb ones. There's plenty of low FODMAP, low carb vegetables out there. Um, I guess with fat, the other thing is, um, you know, in the beginning when we're doing low carb, and we've discussed this previously, so I won't spend a lot of time, but, you know, we, we take a bit of time to get fat adapted and, you know, there is fat in food we eat. So we don't necessarily have to, you know, overload ourselves too much. So, you know, you know, if you're eating chicken and fish and, you know, it's still got natural fat in it, um, you know, full fat dairy. So I think it's about, you know, not necessarily maybe, you know, going into, you know, coffee with cream and, you know, putting, you know, cream cheese and everything and putting loads of butter on stuff. You know, just be mindful of pull it back a bit if you're not tolerating fat. Um, in saying that sometimes because people have been so low fat for so long is that they suddenly, you know, jump into fat and they, they feel a bit yuck. So, you know, just, you know, uh, take a little bit of time, don't overload too much. You're going to get still natural fat in what you eat um, and that's okay um, and just listen to your body and and um, your body can get a little bit adapted to that fat in the gut anyway and so people find they tolerate. It's a bit like salt when we're doing low carb. We say, you know, you need to add some salt and people are like, I don't eat salt um, and, you know, so they just have to try and add a little bit more because we know we need to replace salt and it just takes a bit of time. So the gut will take a bit of time but it often does adapt um and um but you don't have to you know you see you don't have to overload with huge amounts so pull it back if it's not digesting well you're still going to be eating fat you you know you can't eat zero fat and lead, unless you're eating just carbohydrates all day and that's not what we're aiming to do so excuse me <coughs> that's right a couple more questions um paul how does it uh, how does the way a person stores fat matter uh, comparing obviously subcutaneous sort of uh, fat to uh, to uh, what we call visceral obesity or the fat around your internal organs? That's a great question, Peter, because this is something that a lot of people, it, it gets taken, uh, misinterpreted wrong in both directions. So what do I mean? So you would have heard of the term TOFI, T-O-F-I, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And this represents, you know, the, the stereotypical guy who maybe, you know, was an athlete in his youth and he's still pretty skinny today, but he's actually very high risk of heart disease because when you look at him, he looks skinny, thin on the outside, but he's got what we call visceral fat deposition, um, basically fat around the organs. And in the most part, this is strongly, strongly associated with a fatty liver and insulin resistance. And we know that once you have insulin resistance, then all bets are off. Your risk of heart disease starts going way up. Yeah. So it's possible to be relatively skinny, but if you've got fat around the visceral fat, then it's bad news there. Now, the alternative 
while it's much less common, is also true. And it's usually only true for people who have previously been obese, who have adopted healthy lifestyle measures. So they might be doing a, a resistance training exercise and going on a low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet. And they may or may not have lost a bunch of weight. Um, their body weight may, in some cases, be relatively stable or they might have lost a small amount of weight. But when we scan them, we find that they've had large reductions in their visceral fat, but they still have what we call subcutaneous fat. So they still look, I guess, uh, to, the, to the outside eye, they look quite overweight. But when we do what we call a DEXA scan and put them in a machine and we actually see where their fat is, they can actually be quite healthy metabolically. So it's possible to be skinny and to have fat in exactly the wrong spot, or to still be quite overweight, but to have low levels of fat around the organs, which is quite healthy. So the where you put the fat absolutely does matter. So here's the question. How do you tell where your fat is? And the easiest way to do that is with a tape measure. So what I like to get my patients to do is to lie on your back, flat on your back, and wrap a tape measure around your waist at exactly the level of the belly button, the umbilicus. And the reason I get you to lie on your back is because, as you know, that you know, if you once you gain more than a few kilograms, you tend to the belly fat will tend to hang down. So the location of the belly button can actually move. But when you're lying flat on your back, everything gets brought up with gravity, and you're always comparing apples with apples and it makes it a far more accurate measure so obviously if you have an excessive waist circumference and we won't go through the numbers because that um, ethnicity matters as well as gender so we won't go through the particular cutoffs today but this is a fabulous way of assessing whether your visceral fat is likely increasing or reducing lying your back wrap a tape measure around the level of your belly button if that number is getting smaller with time then you're doing beautifully well. And this also comes, speaks to something we call non-scale victories, because I see some comments here for people who are struggling to shift weight. And sometimes when, rather than getting despondent, if you focus on something like what your visceral fat is, what your waist circumference is, even if the scale isn't necessarily moving in the direction you'd like it to be or as much as you'd like it to be if we can actually see your body composition is changing because frequently people are gaining muscle and that's offsetting some of the fat that they're losing and that's why it doesn't show on the scale but if we can see that your belly is getting smaller then you are getting metabolically healthier right now one last question which is a bit of a doozy so Dee's asked she says i'm morbidly obese but not diabetic is a diabetic diet better than uh, to do than keto? I'm getting a lot of mixed information. I've been told to do keto and, and stay under 800 calories and hubby's supposed to stay under 1000 calories. So Nicole, in a couple of minutes, I know that could, uh, that could be at least half an hour, in a couple of minutes, keto, diabetic diets, what, what, you know, what would you be suggesting to this person who's morbidly obese, but not diabetic? Well, I probably pre-diabetic, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I guess I'm going to make an assumption that when one says diabetic diet, that we're talking about the traditional diabetic diet, which would be one that's super high in carbohydrates. So, you know, a lot of people come into me and they might have been prescribed the diabetic diet, which, you know, when you've got pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes is still high in carbohydrate. Now, if you're, you know, overweight or obese, um, usually there is definitely some form of metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, particularly if they're carrying a lot of weight around the belly. So in that case, the traditional diabetic diet is exactly what we're saying is not going to be a good option. It's going to encourage low fat. It's going to encourage 60% of the energy to be coming from carbohydrate because it's going to vilify, don't eat fat, eat small serves of protein and eat you know, lots of whole grain breads and cereals and lots of fresh fruit, um, you know, have your fat-free yogurts. And so that fat-free high-carb message will create worse insulin resistance. That insulin resistance is going to cause the storage of fat. And we know particularly around the visceral area, which then creates more hunger as well. 
So we're going to be hungry, we're going to be hangry, we're going to be craving, we're going to be um, constantly grazing to try and keep topping up our body sugar levels, um, and it's not going to be conducive to, you know, improving weight. Um, so definitely a low-carbohydrate diet. Um, ketogenic is, you know, a little bit different, and I don't think, again, it's the individual, and that's something that we would sit down and look at where people are sitting at as to whether you really need to go into a strict ketogenic diet or just a lower carbohydrate diet um, and avoiding those obvious carbs as we talked about, increasing your protein and healthy fat. So I would be putting a thumbs up to a low carb slash keto diet, we'll call it, which is both eliminating a lot of carbohydrates and encouraging healthy fats and protein. Um, in terms of that 800 calorie, I guess we've kind of answered that. My role, I guess, would be to say, let's just get you fat adapted. Let's get your cells happy using fats instead of protein, uh, instead of carbohydrates and sugars. Let's get you feeling less hungry naturally by eating the right macronutrients. And then down the track, I think there's room for some form of calorie restriction with a low carbohydrate baseline. Um, but certainly I probably wouldn't jump people straight into it because they're just going to be hungry. Their body needs to adapt to using fat as a fuel instead of using sugar. And that can take a bit of time. So I would say low carb, absolutely not a traditional diabetic diet. Even if you don't have diabetes, everyone who struggles with weight, particularly around the belly, has insulin resistance. And that is pre-diabetes already. And it's probably been there for a very long time. And so you will have a lot of insulin resistance and you'll struggle to drop the weight with those traditional diabetic diets. And you'll just feel hungry and you'll feel hangry and you'll feel sad. So I go, go low carb maybe worry about the 800 later. Feed your body when you're hungry. Don't feed it when you're not. And that will naturally get less over time on a low-carbohydrate diet. That is my very quick answer. Fantastic. Right. Well, look, we've really run out of time. Don't forget there's a free beginner's guide to low-carb ebook available. So just uh, click on that and you can get the free ebook. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Thank you to Paul and Nicole. And we'll see you next month. Thanks a lot. Bye.